Uh huh. Or so hover over it. Hover yeah. over it. Okay. Uh, is that dependent on it being a newer version because it doesn't work online? Oh, maybe. Do you have? I thought that doing it on like a desktop, I mean, I could see it. My laptop, I can't actually get the numbers to show. But if I do it on the desktop, like in the MVP, okay. it should have that. I think it might be a, a, is it a newer a version of that. Yeah, it might have been like the newer version. Yeah. Like the MATLAB on the, the MEB computer lab, it works. Okay. Yeah. But you should be able to, in like the MATLAB top tab over the graph, there's a, a little plus symbol. And if you click that, it should show you values when you hover over it. Oh, so there's something you actually have to click on? In possibly at older versions. Okay. Um, I don't know. Yeah, mine's That's 2017, but yeah, it doesn't do that. Very yeah. Very but yeah. So you should be able, there should be a, a plus button or something you can click on that plus shows button. you. Um, mm -hmm. But remember that that you shouldn't be taking your theoretical value from that point. You can use it as a point of comparison. Um, but you should still be doing the hand calculation to get that number for strain at the point. Uh, so... He didn't want us to still do a sample calculation. Not all of uh, we got to communicate better. Um, so I had intended for, for all the points to be calculated point by point, but he's also going to be the one grading it. So at least show a sample calculation for one of them. Um, but the, the problem with the MATLAB thing is it's not entirely accurate because it's discretized. So it's a grid. And so there it's calculating at specific grid points, which means if your point is somewhere in between those, that's not exact. I mean, if you make the grid fine enough, it'll be close enough, but it's not technically the right number, which is why. Ah, damn. All right, I'll, I'll talk with Sarwin. If, if we have an update about it, I'll, I'll send that in the announcement. Yeah. For the discussion question, it's, I think it was like the first one that said, compare the, uh, your, uh, the theoretical strain contraplot from the specimen without the hole to the one that you actually got in the measurement. So are we actually supposed to create a theoretical contra plot for the one without the hole? Because I didn't think that. For the one without a hole, it should just be a uniform strain okay. everywhere. So it should be like uniform x, uniform y, maybe a shear because of the boundary condition, but you're ideally far enough from the boundary condition that there's not really... So we can just do like thing. theoretical and not like actually measure Yeah. I, th I thought I had it as uh, compare the contour plot for the one with the hole from the theory for the hole, but yeah. It wasn't the, the actual DIC, DIC hole and then figure out the hole. Yeah, that's the you, can, you, can, you can have all three of them together, but you don't need a theoretical for the one without a hole because it should just be uniform. So the idea there is you're using that for noise. So if, if it should be perfectly uniform through the thick uh, through the length of it, you can see you can say what your theory should be, and then say a plus or minus bound on top of that based on the noise, which is why we had it had one without a hole to begin with to kind of show off how noisy the IC can be. Yeah. Cool. Other questions, concerns. Hopefully you've all started the DIC lab by now. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I, I looked at the data. <laughs> That's a start. <laughs> okay. I, I would recommend starting it earlier rather than later. Um, Recommendations are one thing. I, I can't force you to do anything. Um, okay. So let's talk about viscoelasticity. Uh, viscoelasticity. Okay, so last Wednesday, two days ago, uh, we talked about two very simple viscoelastic models. So viscoelasticity and is the time-dependent responsive materials. Damn, I forgot my silly putty. Um, it's the time-dependent responsive materials sitting in my office. Um, and so uh, up till now, we've only been looking at uh, elastic responses. So basically, if I apply a step load, I get a step response and strain. Um, or step strain, I have a step response and load. And we came up with two simple models to show some aspects of viscoelasticity. So we had the Maxwell model, uh, 
uh, which was a spring and a dash pot. And remember, we had this mechanical analogy where um, by combining these in series, we can sort of predict some responses. Uh, for the Maxwell model, if I apply a step stress, step stress in time, sigma naught, um, then I get some strain that goes up. Um, epsilon 1 and then linearly increases because of that dash pot it drops down afterward by that same amount epsilon 1 um, doo -doo -doo. so this is not this is a basically an elastic a viscoelastic plastic material so viscoplastic behavior so there's no full recovery which means it's not maybe the best material model for um, for most things um, if we instead apply a step strain, so some strain epsilon naught with time, um, then I get some jump in load and then a gradual decay and a drop back down with time, stress uh, up to some stress naught. Um, and we showed from this Maxwell model that based on the strain, um, this stress, this stress decay, stress equals some E epsilon naught, where sigma naught, E epsilon naught, E to the minus E T over nu. So we showed that there was some exponential decay based on, based on our nice simple um, spring dash pot model. So this phenomena uh, basically is, is relaxation. So, so the Maxwell model captures relaxation of materials pretty well. Uh, captures relaxation, um, but it's maybe not super realistic for most materials, other than um, only realistic for very soft viscous materials. Soft viscous cos um, like silly putty actually silly putty or tar or molten molten metals or molten glass um, that's where a Maxwell model would actually come in useful in an engineering standpoint um, we also had uh, the Kelvin Voigt model so Kelvin Voigt model, where we took a spring and a dash pot and instead combined them in parallel. <laughs> some stress and some strain, some stress and some strain out. Um, and here, if I apply a step stress, step stress, sigma naught, then my corresponding strain response uh, kind of goes, uh, up slowly in time, and then back down in time, slot knots, stress and dash lines, T, where now this strain response is also an exponential. So uh, epsilon naught e to the minus e t over nu. Um, but this is now strain. Strain equals some strain naught e to the minus e t over nu. Um, so again, an exponential decay. And so this, this captures our creep phenomena. Captures creep. Creep, um, but it's also not super realistic for most engineering materials because most materials don't just kind of have a gradual creep. There's some elastic response and then some time dependent creep response. And so basically we need some model that's going to combine those two aspects. So logically, what can we do? As we can kind of mash them up together. 
Um, so there's a model now called the standard linear solid. So SLS standard linear solid um, SLS um, also sometimes referred to as the Zener model because of undoubtedly a guy named Zener who came up with it a long time ago. There's two versions of it that you'll see um, kind of referenced. One is the Maxwell version of the SLS model. So um, Maxwell SLS and this one to kind of capture both of those effects you can get a spring now and then a spring and a dash pot. So I'm mashing these two together. I'm going to call this some E1, E2, and nu. So this is the Maxwell version of the standard linear solid. Um, and this one is, I think, fairly common um, in terms of when people refer to the, the standard linear solid. The other version is the uh, Kelvin standard linear solid. Kelvin SLS which um, for this one I'm going to have a spring now and then a spring and a dash pot. Sigma epsilon E2 E1 and nu. Um, so this is kind of I'm taking my my Maxwell model and my Kelvin model and mashing them together. One, I replace that dash pot with the Maxwell thing. One, I replace this dash pot with the Kelvin void thing. Because it's kind of the nice logical next step. Um, and today I'm going to show you just the analysis for the Maxwell version of it, but the we'll come up to a simplified result in the end that is kind of is similar for both of them and just has slightly different terms in front. So today we're only going to be talking about the Maxwell SLS. So um, to study the Maxwell one now, the, the Maxwell standard linear solid. Okay. Um, so we'll start off. I know that my stress sigma, because these are in parallel, the total stress is the stress one plus the stress two. Um, and my total strain is epsilon one and epsilon two. So the strains are equal. Um, the stress one here now is, is the stress <coughs> on top and the stress two is the stress in this bottom combo here. So it makes it a little bit more complicated to analyze. Um, so I'll go through a little bit of, um, I don't know, algebra gymnastics to show you how we, how we end up at the final at a final solution. But so the sigma one now is just E1 epsilon one or uh, E1 epsilon. E1 epsilon because the strains in these are the same. Um, this sigma two is a little bit more complicated. So you remember from the Maxwell model uh, when we did our derivation, or maybe you remember, um, epsilon two dot is equal to sigma two dot over E two plus sigma two over, oh, did I mix those up? Nope. No, that's good. Okay. Um, so this is what our, our sigma two relationship is. So how do I then figure out how to plug this sigma two back into this guy? Because now there's a rate in there. So this epsilon dot is equal to epsilon. I can move this over and say now solving for sigma two is equal to eta epsilon dot minus eta sigma two dot over E two, which is a part of the step, but we still have this sigma two dot in there. Now I can come back to this relationship up here and say my sigma two dot um, 
or sigma 2 is sigma minus sigma 1 from this relationship, which is also equal to sigma minus e epsilon, e1 epsilon, sorry. Um, then I can take a time derivative of this guy. And so sigma 2 dot is also equal to, if I take a time derivative of this, sigma dot minus e1 epsilon dot. So now I have some relationship for my sigma 2 dot that I can come back over here. So I know now sigma 2 dot is equal to this. So, or sorry, sigma 2 is a sigma minus e1 epsilon. And it's also equal to this term here, eta epsilon dot minus eta over e2 sigma 2 dot which I can now plug this guy back into, sigma dot minus e1 epsilon dot. And now I have some relationship here in terms of not the, not the stresses or strains in these, but only the global applied stresses and strains. So a little bit of algebraic gymnastics, taking derivatives and moving stuff around. Um, I can reorganize this now into something a little bit more convenient, uh, into something a little bit more convenient. This is now sigma uh, plus, I can bring this guy over, eta over e2 sigma dot, um, that's equal to e1 epsilon plus, um, now this kind of weird complicated combo of terms. Um, eta e1 plus e2 over e2 epsilon dot. And so this is what my standard linear solid gives me in the end. So if I reorganize all these terms, I can kind of manipulate everything around to get something of this form. So I'll show you, well, first, um, I can rewrite this now as something that you'll see a little bit more commonly. So this I can rewrite as sigma plus tau epsilon sigma dot um, is equal to E R uh, epsilon plus uh, tau sigma epsilon dot, where tau epsilon is my eta over e2, um, tau sigma is eta e1 plus e2 over e1 e2, um, 2 and e r is just my e1. And so this form is actually slightly more common to see um, because now if I were to go and analyze the Kelvin SLS model I would have I would end up with something in this exact same form these coefficients would just be slightly different this tau epsilon and tau sigma so this is now if you remember from yesterday our, our relaxation time so the relaxation time for these guys um, we, we could define some tau is equal to eta over e. And so this is actually e to the minus t over tau. Um, you'll see now how these relaxation times, the stress relaxation time and the strain relaxation time actually come into play. So if I wanted to study this now, first, cool, followed roughly the derivation. All right. Possibly. Okay. Well, we'll see how it gets used in, in practice here. Um, so I'm going to take that simplified form, sigma plus tau epsilon um, sigma dot plus or is equal to e r epsilon plus tau sigma epsilon dot. 
and my pen is running out of ink. Uh, I feel like it's getting lighter. It might be. Is it? Is it too light on the screen? It's still, is it getting harder to read. Okay. If if it's getting too light, let me know, um, and I can switch back to a, a different pen. Um, okay. So as an example, let's look at uh, a step applied stress. So stress equals some stress not, and I don't have any stress rate. So um, this won't be changing in time, but I'm going to apply now a step stress in time. Stress of sigma naught. And I want to figure out what my stress strain response is for this material, or for, for this sort of a, a loading condition with my standard linear solid. So I can now plug these two in to my standard linear solid model to figure out what my strain would be. So this now, I have some stress naught plus zero is equal to er epsilon plus tau sigma epsilon dot. Um, so I can move some stuff around. Uh, I want to say d epsilon dt now. So I'm solving for this guy um, is equal to er. Um, what do I want? To do you want to move this around? Uh, no, I'm going to leave this on the side for now. Tau sigma, um, sigma naught over ER uh, minus epsilon. I'm going to move these over to one side and these back to the other. So D epsilon over sigma naught over ER minus epsilon. The integral now. Um, is equal to, moving stuff around, the integral of dt over tau sigma. This is from 0 to t. And this is now um, from some initial to some final. So um, solving this, you might recognize this one from yesterday. This is a natural log, and the, the coefficient in front of this epsilon comes out. So this is then minus natural log of sigma naught over ER minus epsilon from epsilon 1 to epsilon um, is equal to now minus, or is equal to T over tau sigma. This I can plug some stuff into um, and say this is minus natural log of this term, sigma naught over ER minus epsilon divided by over ER um, minus my initial. <coughs> I can now solve for this epsilon. Let's throw another piece of paper. There we go. Um, I can solve for this epsilon value, um, take uh, take everything to an exponent, um, move stuff around, I can say sigma naught over er uh, minus epsilon is equal to sigma naught over er minus epsilon 1, um, e to the minus t over tau sigma, then solving for epsilon. This is some um, epsilon sigma naught over er minus plus, how do I want to write that, plus some epsilon minus sigma naught over er e to the minus t over tau sigma. So what this looks like now, so I have some initial stress response 
some long time stress response and an exponential decay to that. So this now is my, my stress relaxation coefficient. So you see stress when I apply a unit stress step, this is the time it takes for the, for the stress to relax. Um, or for my, sorry, for creep to happen, but um, relaxation time when I apply a certain stress. This now looks like if I apply some stress, some sigma naught, um, this jumps up to some initial <coughs> epsilon naught, which is actually sigma naught over ER. Is equal to this. Um, then it'll decay up to some, or it'll creep up to some higher epsilon. When I let go of this, it'll drop back down a certain amount and then decay down over time, where this drop now is also my, my initial jump. So now T um, epsilon sigma T Draw some more dashed lines. Um, this is now a response more closely related to what we would expect a normal polymer to respond, more, more aligned with how we would expect a normal polymer, polymer to respond. So you stretch it out, there's some initial elastic response, and over time it starts to relax. Um, but that initial elastic response is still there. So this is kind of the simplest model we can come up with to properly represent a viscoelastic material. Um, I'll show, yeah, I think I'll have a little bit of time at the end. I'll show what it actually, how, how it's actually practically measured um, or with the practical effect that it has because it's, it's normally hard to get exactly what these coefficients are, that, that E1, E2, tau, because they're kind of made up parameters that we that we're using to to fit a model um, but there are other ways we can sort of estimate how they behave um, but first uh, I'll show a couple other models um, for how actual polymers are, are often modeled show an example of a Maxwell material um, and then talk about how this gets practically applied so um, other models, other viscoelastic models, so again, the SLS model is kind of the simplest one we can quit. Uh, other polymer models, there's ones, the Berger model, or Berger's model, um, which combines, um, spring dash pot and then another dash pot out here at the end and you actually end up with something that's like a second order ODE so if you have not just a, a creep behavior but a time but a rate dependent creep a rate rate so uh, an acceleration dependent behavior you can model something like this um, for another popular one it's called the Weikert model. Weikert. Kurt. Uh, I think this guy's dying. Come on, you can survive. Um, so for this one, nope. I think. I think I'm totally out of juice. Uh, damn. All right. That's all, folks. See you next week. Yeah. If only. Okay. Um, this just won't be erasable, so I may be scratching out mistakes now. Um, oh, that's better. Okay, so the Weikert model, I'm going to draw slightly differently. Um, now what this does is it basically combines a semi-infinite series of springs and dash pots together, um, where this is E0, E1, E2, 
um, e3, a to 1, a to 2, a to 3, and you kind of keep this going for as long as you want. Um, to some EI A to I um, and for this one um, this is kind of maybe not entirely realistic for what um, people would do but they, they you can just kind of combine three, four, or five of these together in a series um, depending on exactly how weirdly your polymer behaves. These are all sort of empirical models, so they're, they're creating a mechanical analogy to try to predict some polymer behavior, um, and then there's a whole bunch of different dynamic tests you can do at different strain rates, at different with different loading configurations, to try to then come up with coefficients for some of these. Um, so they can get kind of complicated. I think the biggest one I saw in a paper had 13 of these parameters, like 13 of these in a series. At that point, I mean, I don't know, what, you can kind of fit anything if you have 13 parameters, but um, but realist like two, three, four is pretty normal for, for people who model polymers. Um, okay, so let's look at an example now of something that you might see on an exam. So um, let's look specifically, this is why I'm mad that I, I forgot my silly putty. Let's look at an example for silly putty. Um, so how long does it take silly putty to relax? So example, how long to relax silly putty? So for this one, we can use a Maxwell model because it's again a very viscous material. So like I had mentioned at the beginning, that's this is the one place vis very viscous materials like silly putty or molten glass or molten metal is where the Maxwell model comes in. So we can use a Maxwell model, um, which is sigma equals sigma naught or e epsilon um, e epsilon naught e to the minus e t over nu. Um, if you remember from yesterday, I had given some new value for city pu silly putty uh, as 8 times 10 to the 4 Pascal seconds. Um, silly putty Young's modulus is actually something around 1.7 times 10 to the 6th Pascals, or uh, 1.7 MPa, so it's very soft, uh, very compliant material. And I want to find if I apply apply some epsilon naught of zero point one, so some small strain. How uh, how long to reach sigma naught over ten? So, or first, what is my initial stress, and then? how long does it take that stress to decay by a factor of 10? So how long does it take to go to drop by, by 10? Um, so initially, at time 0, sigma at time 0 is equal to e epsilon naught e to the 0, which is just 1. Um, so this is just 0 0.17 MPa, because I take that 1.7 multiplied by 0.1. Um, and now I want to find what sigma at time t1 is equal to sigma naught over 10. So I can say this is sigma naught e to the minus e t over nu, uh, where sigma naught now is e epsilon naught. Um, I can move some stuff around. So this now, I can say these sigmas would cancel. Um, e minus e d over nu is equal to natural log of 1 over 10. Or t is equal to um, 
I can multiply this and flip this upside down. Eta over e, natural log of 10, um, which is then 8 times 10 to the fourth over 1.7 times 10 to the sixth times natural log of 10. So you can already tell that this is going to be fairly small because of how big this ratio is. Um, so now if I plug in some numbers, this ends up being about 0 0.11 seconds. So very, very, very fast, which is why if you remember yesterday when I, when I pulled the Silly Putty very quickly, it broke. But in order to get it to break, you have to pull it really, really quick because that stress will decay in such a rapid time. So if I pull it at any slow rate, basically it's, it's so viscous or has such a low viscosity that it's able to just realign and all the stress goes away almost instantaneously. Um, if I left it sitting for a second, so sigma at one second, sigma of one is sigma naught e to the minus e times one over nu, uh, which is about 5.9 times 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 10 um, sigma naught. So after a second, I mean, there's pretty much no stress left in this thing. So it decays, I mean, almost to zero. But what we're looking at now is, um, or what, what we're basically representing is if I apply a unit strain, epsilon sum epsilon naught with time, this now goes up to some stress and then decays down to something. So some stress naught. And we were trying to see what stress over 10 would be. This is T1. So we found that this T1 is, is about 0 0.1 seconds. So very, very fast. Uh, cool. Perfect. I think it was just about enough time. So um, this sort of a problem on an exam about viscosity is, or on, a, on an exam about uh, linear or viscoelastic materials, if there's a numerical question, it's going to be something similar to this. Um, although there may be conceptual questions kind of related to generally what we've been talking about with viscoelastic materials. Yeah. So is that in the equation that you want us to use? Uh, you should know Maxwell's version of this equ of the viscoelastic equation. Um, it's also generally good to know the <laughs> the standard linear solid one and the Kelvin one. So the just for both of these, that there's an exponential decay for Maxwell and Kelvin, um, and that for the standard linear solid, you end up with something like this, although um, you probably don't need to know the exact form of the equation, because I don't think I'll have you use it uh, numerically on an exam. Um, yeah? Uh, so you said Maxwell is good for um, I'm not actually sure. I couldn't find any good examples where, where it came up. I'm sure there is. It wouldn't. I mean, it, it's a nice conceptual one, but I think it's of less practical utility. Um, yeah, because basically you have something that has almost an infinite initial stiffness and then kind of just creeps really slowly afterward, which is weird. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, I couldn't find a good example where, where it actually comes in. Thanks, huh? Other questions? Okay. So, I'm going to talk really briefly about um, how the standard linear solid actually gets used in practice for determining material properties. And so specifically, there's something weird that happens with viscoelastic materials known as damping. So damping. So 
So if I take an elastic material and I apply some sort of sinusoidal stress to it, sin stress, um, I'm going to draw another axis now, strain, stress, stress knot, minus stress knot. Um, in an elastic material, I would expect, if I'm applying a sinusoidal stress, that the strain would match with the same phase. So it would just kind of, there would be some different sine amplitude, or some different amplitude for the strain, but it would still be in phase. Or this is some epsilon naught and some minus epsilon naught. So they would kind of line up and they would respond linearly to each other. So this is elastic. Um, in a stress strain map, uh, basically I'd be going up and down kind of this line back and forth and back and forth where this is some stress knot, this is some strain knot, and I'm kind of just going back and forth and back and forth. And I would expect it to lie on a straight line if I was in the in the elastic regime. If it was plastic it would do something different, but we're not going to worry about that. Um, for a viscoelastic material now, there's a time dependent response to this. So what happens when you apply these sort of sinusoidal amplitudes is these don't end up being in phase because if I push with my stress my strain goes up but then it has some delay here my stress is still positive so my strain actually keeps going a little bit afterwards until I until I switch to a to a negative sign and then it slowly pulls it back the other way um, but what you actually end up with for a viscoelastic material when you apply these sine, this is time, this is time, stress, strain. Um, if I apply now some sine stress amplitude, my strain can actually be shifted by some amount. And so it's no longer actually in phase minus epsilon naught, stress naught, minus stress naught. It's no longer actually in phase with my stress. So I end up with a phase lag, some phase lag delta here, um, which, let's refocus that. Um, for those of you in systems, are you starting to look into complex analysis at all? Imaginary real space? Okay, cool. That's what I figured. So I won't go into that in too much detail. Um, but this go elastic. Um, so what this actually looks like now in stress strain space is um, I get something that's more of an ellipse. So as I trace this out in space, um, I get some stress knot, some epsilon knot, are my max stress and strain. Um, and all inside here, what this actually represents, what, what the inside of this curve represents, is this is all dissipated energy. dissipated energy. So um, what's actually happening here is internally, basically the, the, this is very common with, with polymers in particular, um, your polymer, polymer chains are rubbing and sliding, rubbing, sliding, um, and generating internal friction. as they kind of move around all on top of each other. So because there's some some microstructure in there where the polymers are loose in the material, they're able to move around and that motion has some time-dependent property. 
So when you vibrate it, it actually damps out some of that energy. So when you hear the term damping, it's always with viscoelastic materials, and it's specifically talking about this sort of dissipated energy that you get when it's uh, vibrating a material. Yeah. So the frequency would be the same. So, right. So here, uh, my stress would be some stress knot cosine of omega t. My strain would then be some strain knot cosine of omega t or minus. Oh, damn, erase. I can't erase now. Um, minus some delta. So it's it's being shifted. They would be in the same phase, but there, there's now a lag between those phases. Um, to solve what that phase lag would be, um, so this actually, this is actually where the standard linear solid model comes in. Um, but you can take, um, you can take, kind of your sigma, represent cosines and sines in complex space. Uh, is some sigma naught e to the i omega t epsilon equals epsilon naught e to the i omega t. Um, plug these in to your standard linear solid model. So you would plug them in here. When you take a derivative of these guys, sigma dot is now i omega sigma naught e to the i omega t. Um, and so you get some complex complex part of it. I don't actually expect you to know all of this stuff, but I think it's interesting at least to kind of see where it comes up. Um, when you, you would take these all, plug them into your standard linear solid, reorganize stuff, and end up with um, the tangent of your, of your damping, of your phase lag, is basically the imaginary part of your stress over the real part of your stress which ends up being, in terms of the coefficients that we had before, um, our tan delta is some omega tau sigma minus tau epsilon over one plus omega squared tau sigma tau epsilon. So how you would actually measure these coefficients experimentally is you would be applying different oh, is you'd be applying different frequencies to your material and seeing how it responds to how it damps out at different frequencies. So this is how the standard linear solid is used in practice. Okay, um, homework is posted due next week on Wednesday. Uh, next week we'll talk about fatigue. Cool. Uh, oh, homework, homework five is up here on the table. Please grab it if you haven't already.